You, you put your suits on. Give us a twirl. Okay, good evening, guys. Uh, I hope you're all doing well. Uh, and I'm here tonight to introduce our speaker. But before I just introduce him, I want to say a huge warm welcome to those of you who are joining us online, who are listening to us. If you don't know who we are, if you've randomly stumbled upon us, we'd love you to visit our website. That's capingraid.org. Uh, go and check it out. Have a nosy. Find out who we are. Find out what we do. Um, I'm here tonight to introduce Charles, Charles Price, who is our guest lecturer. We have had the pleasure of having him speaking over the last couple of days and really enjoying um, and getting to grips with what he's saying. Uh, and we get another wonderful session tonight. So just before I hand over to him, let me just pray for him and then I will uh, leave you in his very capable hands. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your goodness and your greatness in our lives. Um, we pray tonight that as we begin to tune in and, and listen in to what you have for us, uh, we pray that we can uh, leave any baggage uh, just to one side and really listen to what you have for us, Lord. Um, we pray that we have open hearts and open ears to be uh, taught and molded and shaped into what you want us to be shaped into, Lord. Uh, we pray for Charles. We pray that you give him boldness to declare your word. Um, and we just thank you for um, all the gifts that you have given him. We thank you that he is here tonight with us uh, and that we get to enjoy um, yet more wonderful teaching uh, from him that you have blessed him with. We pray for all these things in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. And... Uh... This is the sixth session of the day for you folks. So I hope you're alert and awake enough. We are looking into the book of Acts, which um, we've been looking at for the last few days. We have eight sessions in all, and therefore, out of 28 chapters, I'm being selective and uh, covering what I consider to be key issues in the book and key issues that equip us for the Christian life and for fruitfulness. And tonight, I'm going to talk about the fullness of the Holy Spirit. That's a phrase that occurs in a number of passages in the book of Acts, nine altogether, and also elsewhere in the New Testament. And uh, this morning, when we were looking at the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, uh, you remember when Ananias went to the house where he was in Damascus, and entering it, he placed his hands on Saul. This is in Acts 9, verse 17. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Spirit. This phrase already occurred on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, and all of them, chapter 2, verse 4 says, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, the big $64,000 question is, what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? And I want to talk about this uh, this evening. The phrase to be filled or to be full of the Holy Spirit occurs nine times in the book of Acts, and only one other occasion in the epistles in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18. I want to look at all these uh, occasions with you and try and piece together exactly what we are to understand by this because although the phrase is used, being filled with the Spirit, being full of the Spirit, the Scripture never stops and puts a big bracket and says, this is what we mean by that, end bracket. So we have to work it out by the context and the events that surround uh, the use of this phrase. And uh, in the book of Acts, we'll look at the nine occasions of the book of Acts first. It has three contexts in which this, this expression is used. First of all, 
It is used of an event that takes place in people's lives. So, for instance, having quoted the day of Pentecost, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. It was an event that took place the moment the Spirit of God was poured out because on the day of Pentecost, that was the day the Holy Spirit was gifted to the people of God and the church was born. And as they received the Holy Spirit, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Indication is it was an instantaneous event in their lives. Similarly, the reference I just gave you in Acts chapter 9, verse 17, uh, was Saul of Tarsus. When he arrived in Damascus, and Ananias went to him in uh, chapter 5 and verse 17. Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And at that moment, Saul of Tarsus was converted. He wasn't converted on Damascus Road when he was blinded when he saw Jesus because he spent three days in darkness. And when Ananias came to him, one of the things he said to him was, be baptized, wash away your sin, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Those two things there, uh, meaning that he had not yet been truly born again of the Spirit. His sins had not yet been washed away. And so you have these two occasions when the receiving of the Holy Spirit led to the fullness of the Holy Spirit uh, right away. And I think we can say that is intended to be the norm, but we know that often it isn't in the lives and experience of many people. For one of two reasons, either ignorance, we don't know that the Spirit of God comes to fill our lives, and we'll explain what full means in a moment, or through disobedience. We can resist the Spirit. Stephen said in Acts chapter 7, we can quench the Spirit. Paul writes about that. We can grieve the Spirit. We can prevent him doing uh, what he was given us to do. But that's the first context in which it's used, just two references. It was an event that took place in a moment. The second of the three in the, the book of Acts is that it was a condition. That is, there were some people who were described as being full, as a condition. Let me give you the examples. In Acts chapter 6 and verse 3, when they were going to appoint uh, folks in the church in Jerusalem to be looking after some of the practical needs of the church, it says, brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We'll turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And then it adds a few other people. They join with them. Now notice, it says, choose these seven men known to be full not known to have been filled. Had they got a testimony on a certain date at a certain time they were filled? Well, they probably do, but that's not the point. If you meet them on Monday morning, they're full of the Spirit. You meet them on Tuesday night, they're full of the Spirit. Meet them out playing soccer, they're full of the Spirit. Meet them on Sunday, they're full of the Spirit. Meet them in the prayer meeting, they're full of the Spirit. Meet them when they're having their lunch, they're full of the Spirit. Known to be full as a continuous condition of people's lives. Uh, Barnabas, or oh, actually here, let me just mention Stephen again, because when Stephen faced martyrdom, as he was being crushed by the stones or being thrown at him, it says in chapter 7, verse 55, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. That was the last moment of Stephen before he was crushed with the final stone that probably crushed his head or something. And uh, I think I mentioned the other day that it's intriguing. It says Jesus looked up and saw, sorry, Stephen looked up and saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Normally he's seated at the right hand of God. On this occasion he's standing, perhaps to welcome the first martyr home, which was Stephen. But what I find interesting is that Stephen, full of the Spirit, sees Jesus, Jesus sees him, and Jesus does nothing to prevent his martyrdom. 
I'm going to talk tomorrow night about the role of persecution, including martyrdom, in the book of Acts and through Christian history. And Jesus does not prevent it. He didn't hear. Even full of the Holy Spirit at that point. And then uh, in Acts 11, verse 24, there's a man called Barnabas, who's, I think, my favorite character in the New Testament. Name means encourager, and every time he occurs, that's exactly what he's doing. And it says of him, he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. That was his condition. He was full. Thirdly, it is used, the phrase to be filled with the Spirit is used as an equipping. And in this instance, it is used of people who we know are already filled with the Holy Spirit, because the Scriptures explained that to us about them, but it is an empowering for a particular task. To give you an example, uh, Peter, Acts chapter 4, was brought before the Sanhedrin Council. Now we know Peter was one of the disciples on the day of Pentecost, was filled with the Spirit, got up and preached with power and authority afterwards. And now a couple of days later, he's standing before the Sanhedrin Council, who, who crucified Jesus only a few weeks before, who brought about his crucifixion a few weeks before. And it says that Peter, before the Sanhedrin Council, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, and what he then said doesn't matter. The point is, as he stood to speak, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and the folks who listened to him speak would have said to themselves, man, this guy has authority. Filled with the Spirit. This is an equipping in this instance for this particular service. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 31, after Peter and John had been imprisoned and then released from prison, it says, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. This is some of the early disciples together. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. These are folks who had been filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Now they are filled in this particular sense where they spoke boldly. And it was an equipping for them. Also in chapter 13 and verse 9, where you've got Saul, uh, Paul, as he became, who was on his first missionary journey, was in Cyprus, and uh, a sorcerer called Elimas had come and challenged them, and Paul rebuked him, and it says, Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimas and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. And uh, his speaking of that was in the fullness of the Holy Spirit with the authority that would derive from that. One more instance, at chapter 16, ch sorry, chapter 13, verse 52, when Paul and Barnabas and their gang who were on their first journey were expelled from Pisidian Antioch on their first missionary journey, it says, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit filled with the Holy Spirit there, and these are already active disciples uh, who we know have been filled before. Now, I've given you all the references to being filled or being full of the Holy Spirit that occur in the book of Acts. It has to do with an event that takes place in some instances when the Holy Spirit comes, occupies a person, he fills them, they receive him, and they, he fills them at the same time, or it's a condition that people know to be in, or it's an equipping in a particular circumstance, a particular task. There is a particular anointing that comes on them that uh, Luke, the uh, historian who wrote this book, calls uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit. There's only one more reference in the whole of the New Testament after Pentecost. There actually are references in... Um, in uh, Luke's gospel, to John the Baptist being filled with the Spirit from his mother's womb, and to his mother and his father both being full of the Spirit. Uh, but that is pre-Pentecost, and we're looking now at the understanding of this after Pentecost, when this whole new era that we call the church 
was ushered in. But in the epistles, Paul wrote 13 of them. James wrote one, Peter wrote two, John wrote uh, four, uh, including Revelation, Book of Hebrews, and all those uh, letters. This phrase is absent except from one, which is in Ephesians 5, verse 18. And in that instance, it is a command. Paul writes there, he says, uh, therefore, in verse 17, well, 18, do not be foolish. Understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, but instead be filled with the Spirit. There are two commands in that verse. Command number one, do not get drunk on wine. <laughs> If you're in the mood for popping into a pub and drinking, getting drunk, says Paul, don't. That's a command. Don't get drunk. He told Timothy, take a little wine for his health's sake, but don't get drunk. Equally a command. Be filled with the Spirit. It is given in the present continuous tense, so more literally it should read, be being filled with the Spirit as an ongoing event in your life. Now, if this is a command, it is therefore something that we are responsible for. If something is a promise, God is responsible to give it. If something is a command, we are responsible for it, to act in such a way that this command becomes operative. The initial giving of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts was a promise in Acts chapter 1 and verse 4, where before the ascension of Jesus, it says to us, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. The first instruction in the book of Acts was not go. It was wait. Sit down. Just wait. For the gift my father is going to give to you, and they waited for 10 days between the ascension and the day of Pentecost. Peter, don't go running off and trying to preach because you'll only mess things up like you have already. You will not be equipped. You will not have the Holy Spirit living in you in the way you will do if you wait for 10 days. So just wait. And it is a gift my father has promised. He will give it to you. You don't have to be having a prayer meeting when it happens. You just have to be around and available. And uh, my father will give what he has promised. So when God makes a promise, relax. Don't try to make it work. Relax. He'll make it work. That's why it's a promise. But having been the recipient of that promise and the recipient, therefore, of the Holy Spirit, this now becomes a command, an obligation, be filled with the Spirit. Now, the big question is, of course, is uh, what does this mean? I'm, uh, yeah, what does this mean? Let me first clear up two areas of confusion that uh, I personally have had in my own Christian life, and I think many other people do as well. The first is that to be filled with the Spirit does not mean to have more of the Spirit than we had before. The language filled seems to indicate that. If I were to take this jug and I was to fill this glass, what I do, obviously, is I pour water from the jug into the glass. Whoa, not too much. I have to drink that now. And that's our normal use of the word filled. We kind of top something up. But that is not the use of the word here, because the Holy Spirit is a person. We either have him or we don't. Now you can have more of a person's trust, you can have more or less of a person's confidence, more or less of a per person's attention, more or less of a person's love, but you can't have more or less of a person. Because uh, we are complete and the Holy Spirit is a personal being. And when you are doing... Yeah, studies in the, in, in the personal work of the Holy Spirit earlier in this year, 
no doubt you will have talked about that. He's not an impersonal force, like a wind he might fly a kite, a kite against, uh, or petrol, gasoline, which you might put in your car to help it to run, or steam that would drive a steam engine, some power to harness uh, for our own effect. No, the Holy Spirit is a person. He's either in us or he is not in us. He may be quenched in us, locked up in a corner, but it's not receiving more of the Holy Spirit. And I was confused by that many years ago. I wanted more of the Spirit, and then I understood one day, everything God has to give to me, he has already given to me by giving me the Lord Jesus Christ indwelling my heart by the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who lives the life of Jesus Christ in me. And he had been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ, is what we're told elsewhere. You have everything you need for life and godliness in your knowledge of Christ. And it is the Holy Spirit who is the member of the Trinity who lives the life of Jesus Christ, which was a physical life, lived on earth once, now on the right hand of the Father, but now live by him in us uh, through the Holy Spirit. So um, it doesn't mean we have more of the Spirit than we already had. A second thing, and when I was young, I got caught up in this when I was a young Christian. It doesn't mean you have to empty yourself in order to be filled with the Spirit, you know, to make room. I remember as a teenager, going to hear uh, somebody preach, and uh, he held up a glass of water, and uh, he said, if I am going to fill this glass with milk, what do I have to do first? And I sat there, looking all intelligent, and I said to myself, if you're going to fill that glass with milk, you'll have to first empty it of the water. And then the preacher said, if I'm going to fill this glass with milk, I first have to empty it of the water. I thought, whoa, I got it right. So he said, if you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you have to first empty yourself of yourself. Well, it sounded great, but then I tried to do it. How in the world, do you, what is yourself? Who is yourself? How do you empty yourself of yourself? And uh, of course, Scripture tells us we cannot do that. It, it says we have an old nature which will never be converted, that old nature, the, what is of the flesh is flesh. It is corrupt and broken. We'll leave it behind at the grave. And it will constantly war against the spirit. There's going to be a civil war in our soul till the day we die. You're not unusual if you battle with the same temptations again and again and again. There's a civil war going on. It's not getting rid of that old nature. I once went to speak for a week in a church up in Scotland, actually. It was a week of meetings I had, and it was a church that believed that your old nature could be crucified and done away with and no longer bothering you. And uh, we had testimonies most nights. I, I wasn't preaching this. Uh, they had testimonies. People say, you know, I've been a Christian for five years, and I struggle with the same old temptations. And then one day I claimed a clean heart and a pure heart. And God gave me a pure heart, and I have not been troubled with the temptations since. And I encourage you, they would say, to claim your clean heart from God. The only problem was I spent a lot of time talking to and counseling with people who had given testimony who said it actually doesn't work that way, but I know it's supposed to. Why do you think it's supposed to? Well, because that's what they teach us here. It's not supposed to. It never says it is. I met a man once, by the way, who, who told me uh, after a meeting when I'd been talking about this indwelling sin principle, he, he said to me, I, I want you to know that God, 15 years ago, gave me a pure heart, a clean heart, and I've not sinned for 15 years. So he told me. So I didn't know what to say to him. So I said, that's wonderful. <laughs> and tell you, you haven't sinned for 15 years? He said, no, by the grace of God. I said, are you married? He said, yes. Is your wife here tonight? He said, yes. Do you point her out to me? Well, she's a lady over there. Uh, why? You asked me to point her. I said, I want to have a talk to her. 
She said, what about us? I wanted to ask her about your sinlessness for the last 15 years. And he said, <laughs> she doesn't agree with me. I said, really? Now then, why doesn't she agree with you? He said, she defines sin differently to me. Really? How do you define sin? How does she define sin? He defines sin by a verse in Hebrews 10, 26. If we sin willfully after receiving knowledge and forgiveness, etc. So he defines sin as waking up in the morning and saying, today I'm going to have a really good sin. Which one shall I do? Well, I hope most of us don't do that. But we might be tempted to. The big problem with sin is that you don't plan it. It just sneaks up on you because the old nature is corrupt. So it's not getting rid of that. You're not going to get rid of that. And you and I are never going to be in a position where we sit down and say, at last, I'm spiritual. At last, I'm godly. At last, I feel I'm like Jesus. Uh, you are not ever going to get to that. In fact, the more you grow in the Christian life, the more you know you're not like Jesus. It's not that you then become more discouraged. You become more wrapped up in who he is and what he is doing in you and through you. And you and I are the last people to see what God is doing in our lives. It's other people who see that. That's another subject altogether. Now, a clue, I think, so that's what it does mean. A clue as to what it does mean is to see how the word filled is used elsewhere in the book of Acts, because this word appears in other contexts in Acts as well. So, for an example, in Acts 3, verse 9 and 10, uh, when uh, the man of the temple gate had been healed by Peter, it says, when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. They were filled with wonder. They were filled with amazement. What does that mean? Did they empty themselves of everything else and just, mm, just fill up with wonder? Uh, let me give you another verse in uh, Acts 5, verse 17. Uh, Acts 5, 17, this is when the apostles uh, saw the great crowds responding to the gospel in Jerusalem and the high priest and all his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. What does it mean to be filled with jealousy? This is the same writer who just said they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Now he says they're filled with envy, they're filled with jealousy. Because actually envy is in, Acts, in chapter 13 and verse 45, where some translations like the NIV I use says jealousy. When the Jews saw the crowds, it's in Pisidian Antioch, they were filled with jealousy, talked abusively against what Paul was saying. Uh, the King James and some other translations say filled with envy. What does it mean to be filled with envy? Chapter 13 and verse 52, it says, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to be filled with joy? Uh, Acts 16, verse 34, the Philippian jailer was filled with joy because he'd come to believe in God. So these words are used, this word filled, are used in other contexts as well. And to understand what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit, we need to ask what does it mean to be filled with wonder, to be filled with amazement, to be filled with jealousy, to be filled with envy, and to be filled with joy. And I suggest to you this, that these emotions, these are primarily emotions here. Yeah, what does it mean to be filled with wonder? I'm a bit slow putting that slide on the screen. Uh, that these emotions uh, dominated their personalities and determined their behavior. So when Luke says they were filled with wonder, was it because somebody came up and said, I want to give you my testimony tonight. I have been filled with wonder. No, he saw them bouncing around with eyes the size of saucers. He said, they've been filled with wonder. Why? Because... Wonder dominates their personality and determines their behavior. Look at how they're behaving. When it says they were filled with jealousy, was that because somebody got up and announced, I want you to know that last night I was filled with jealousy? No. They looked at them, the way they squinted their eyes and the way they clenched their teeth and the way they began to plot to, 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 to uh, undermine these apostles. And Luke, the writer, says they were filled with jealousy. 
And later they were filled with envy. And when he says uh, about the Philippian jailer and the disciples in Pisidian Antioch, they were filled with joy. How do you know they were filled with joy? Because of the way they were bouncing around on cloud nine, saying, wow, fantastic, hallelujah, this is wonderful. And Luke wrote, they are filled with joy. Joy dominates their personality and determines their behavior. How do you know when a man or a woman is filled with the Holy Spirit? I suggest to you, it's very straightforward. The Holy Spirit dominates their personality and determines their behavior. Not because they say, well, you know, last week I was filled with the Holy Spirit. That's great. There are times in our experience we look back on them, we thank God for, we remember them, but because the Holy Spirit dominates their personality and determines their behavior. I find it interesting that uh, when Paul said, be filled with the Spirit, he contrasted it with being drunk uh, when he said, do not get drunk on wine, which is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, as though there is some similarity between being drunk on the one hand and being filled with the Holy Spirit on the other, because back in Acts chapter 2, uh, on the day of Pentecost, in verse 13, it says, some made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. They're drunk, these folks. And Peter stood up and said, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine o'clock in the morning, which means the bars aren't open yet. But how interesting. The people said they're drunk, they've had too much wine. And Peter's first explanation is these men are not drunk. And when Paul writes about being filled with the Spirit, he says, don't get drunk but be filled with the Spirit. I think the reason is because being drunk can be an illustration of what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I studied in Glasgow for three years. At least I was in Glasgow for three years. And uh, Glasgow at that time had a reputation for being the city with the highest rate of alcoholism in Europe. That has changed now. That's how it was way back then. And uh, I saw people who were the worst for alcohol frequently. I stayed in a residence right in the center of the city, just a little up from the central station. And you go out in the evening and you would see people on the street and invariably you'd see folks who were drunk. How did I know they were drunk? Well, sometimes I might see somebody coming down the sidewalk, and as he came down the sidewalk, a little bit like this, I could say to myself, oh, I think he's drunk. Bouncing shoulder off the window, across to the telegraph uh, the light back again. And I could tell he was drunk by the way he walked. Unable to keep an even keel. And then sometimes they would uh, see me and other people like me, and they would hold on to a lamppost. And as we got close, they'd say, can, can you give me some money? I haven't had a cup of tea for a week. And you said to yourself, he really is drunk. And you could tell he was drunk by the way he talked. Speech would be slurred. And it wasn't good policy to give money. If you're going to do anything, take them for a cup of tea. But they didn't want a cup of tea, of course. But uh, it wasn't good policy. So sometimes they would leave the lamppost and lean across and grab hold of your arm and hold you and say, and breathe into your face and say, but I haven't had a cup of tea for a week. And as they breathed into your face, you knew they were drunk by the way they smelt. They would stink of it. What do you think of the evidences of being filled with the Holy Spirit? I suggest to you it's the way we walk, the way we talk, 
and the way we smell. I'll explain that, especially the latter one, before you start claiming great spirituality for your roommates. <laughs> the way we walk. Oh, I've just given you all that. The way they walk, a drunk person assists, the way they talk, the way they smell, they have enough intoxicating liquor to dominate their personality and determine their behavior. That's how you know when a person is drunk. How do you know when they're filled with the Holy Spirit? First of all, by the way they walk. Let me give you just a few verses from Scripture. Galatians 5 verse 16 says, walk in the Spirit. That has motion to it. That has movement to it. That has progression to it. That's about going around your daily life and doing what you do, whether it's at work, study, at home, in the soccer field, wherever it might be. Walk in the Spirit, Galatians 5 verse 16 says. Ephesians 5 verse 2 says, walk in love. And to walk in the Spirit is to walk in love. Because the fruit of the Spirit is love. And uh, 1 John 1 verse 9 says, walk in the light. And to walk in the Spirit is to walk in love. And to walk in love is to walk in the light because everything is open and laid there. And as Rob Whitaker said to us half an hour ago, that he and his wife have no secrets. They know everything about each other. And so it should be to walk in the light is to walk in the spirit, open, honest, and laid bare. First evidence somebody's filled with the Holy Spirit is the way they walk, the way they move through life. Not just what they do, you know, if they're preachers on the platform, and oh yes, they're filled with the Spirit, look what they do. But the way they, they are backstage, the way they are back at home, the way a man treats his wife, a wife treats her husband and the parents treat their kids. It's utterly consistent because they're walking in the spirit and moving in the spirit. Second thing, the way they talk. It's an interesting thing. Nearly every time it speaks of being filled with the spirit in the book of Acts or in Ephesians, something happens to the mouth. In uh, Ephesians 5, verse 18. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Listen, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So he says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. What's the next thing? Speak to one another, because something's going to come out of your mouth. Acts chapter 2 and verse 4 day of Pentecost, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. They began being filled with the Spirit. Languages had never learned began to bubble out of them. You will have no doubt studied that when you were doing the series on the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, but it does reverse something very significant on the day of Pentecost. It's the second time in history that people spoke in tongues, as you probably know. The first time was at the Tower of Babel, when people tried to get up to God, build that great tower in Genesis 11, get up to God, and God came down and he confused them with tongues, and they could no longer understand each other. They were speaking languages no one understood. It divided human beings in Genesis chapter 11. Now the gospel restores human beings, and on the day of Pentecost, he gave the gift of tongues in such a way that 17 nationalities listed in Acts 2 who were present all heard in their own language the wonderful works of God. It was a demonstration of unity as opposed to uh, uh, division that came on the, uh, on the Tower of Babel. So whatever else its significance is, and there is significance apart from that, uh, it was reversal of that division of the Tower of Babel by the unity created by the uh, pouring out of the Holy Spirit. But something happened to their mouths. They spoke in tongues in such a way that people understood who did not know their language. 
uh, because of the languages that they were speaking. Acts 4 and verse 8. Uh, before the Sanhedrin council, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them. Filled with the Spirit meant some words came out of his mouth. In Acts 4.31, when Peter and John were released from prison, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. The connection there, filled with the Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. In Acts 13 and verse 9, uh, on Cyprus, where Saul rebukes this sorcerer called Elimas, Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimas and said, what he said is not relevant. The point is, filled with the Spirit, he said and spoke with authority. Why is the mouth an evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit? Because in Matthew 12 and verse 34, there's a phrase there, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. What's going on in somebody's heart will make us red to the mouth. That's why if you hang around people long enough and listen to what they say long enough, you know exactly what their heart is like. A bitter heart will begin to express in bitter language. A heart of kindness will express itself in kindness. Certainly overflow of the heart that the mouth speaks. It is the talk that reveals the walk, which is the first evidence, and then the second evidence of being filled with the Spirit. The third, I suggest to you, is the way they smell. Now you say, where are you going to get that from? Well, here in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14 to 16, Paul says, Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To one we are the smell of death, to the other the fragrance of life. Now, interesting picture. Through us, Christ spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him. We are the aroma of Christ. We smell of Christ. He's saying there, both to those who are saved and those who are perishing. To one, it's the smell of death. It intimidates them. It frightens them. The other, it's the fragrance, the smell of life. And it's always a wonderful thing. I travel widely, and I often will come across somebody who I don't know, never met before, and I sense they know Jesus Christ. There's something about their lives. One of the first times and dramatic times for me was uh, in uh, India, and I was traveling on a train from Bangalore to Kerala down the southeast. And it was my first visit to India, and I was with somebody else, and we traveled a third class because it was so cheap. <laughs> and then we discovered why it was so cheap. There were no windows. Just you didn't want any windows. You wanted the air to come in. It was so hot. Wooden slats that we uh, sat on, crammed together, and uh, most folks seemed to have the weight of the world sitting on their shoulders. You looked around, and they looked at us because we were a bit odd. My friend was, uh, was from Bangalore, and uh, he, had a, he, he had a jacket and a tie on, and uh, I don't know why he did that. Nobody else wore anything like that, so we were a bit odd to them. But as I looked around that compartment full of quite a few people. There's a guy sitting over diagonally to me. He looked exactly like everybody else, dressed exactly like everybody else. But when I looked into his face, I sensed that guy had something these other people don't have. He looked into his eyes, and it seemed like there was somebody at home there. <laughs> and uh, I began to think to myself, I wonder if that guy's a, a Christian. I wonder if that's Jesus I can see. It was an overnight journey, the most uncomfortable journey I've ever made in my life, I think. 
And at one point, I went out to go to the washroom and so on, and, and he was standing then in the corridor, and I came back, and I said, uh, I said, uh, good evening, whatever time it was, or hello, I've forgotten exactly the words, just to make a connection. Then I said, you mind if I ask you a question? I said, are you a Christian? And his face lit up and he said, yes, I am. How did you know? I said, I could just sense that you were. He said, are you? And I said, yes, I am. And he seemed surprised by that. <laughs> so it didn't work both ways. But here's a man about whom was the aroma of Christ. Actually, he had been to Bangalore. He was involved in the translation of a Bible into one of the local small dialects down in Kerala. He'd been up to help the translators with some of the language things, and now he was going back, uh, and, uh, uh, and he was on the, the same train doing so. But there was the aroma of Christ about him. And my wife and I have often seen people say, I wonder if they're a Christian, because you sense something about them that speaks of Christ. How do you know when a man or a woman is filled with the Holy Spirit? It is that the Holy Spirit dominates their personality and determines their behavior, the way they walk, in the spirit, in love, in the light. The way they talk, things that come out of their mouths. And the very atmosphere of their lives, the way they smell. Now, how does this work out? And I want to give you one verse to close with, which is a principle, and I didn't put it on my screen, but it's a, it's, it's a verse which contains a very important principle uh, in the Christian life. It's in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6 and verse 7. He says, so then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, so continue to live in him, rooted in him, built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thanksgiving. What I like about that verse is the as, so, as what? As you receive Christ Jesus as Lord. How did you receive Christ Jesus as Lord? Well, it was through repentance and faith. Acknowledging in myself, I don't have what it takes to be what I was created to be. I realize I've fallen short. I realize I'm inherently broken. I confess that to you. I turn from my sin and I put my faith, Lord Jesus Christ, in your ability to do for me what I can never do for myself. And you become a Christian as you receive Christ. I can't, he can. As you receive Christ, so live. If you know enough to become a Christian, you know enough how to live, and that is in repentance and faith. God, I acknowledge every day my own inability, my own weakness, my own sin nature, and I realize I've got a battle with this thing for the day I die, and I acknowledge it, I confess it to you, but I thank you that you, Lord Jesus, are sufficient for me as you were sufficient to save me when I became a Christian. You're, fish, you're sufficient to save me as I be now the Christian I have become. I'm going to trust you. And he goes on to say, rooted in him. Stick your roots into him. How do you do that? You do that through scripture. You do that through experience as you daily relate everything in your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And rooted in him, you'll be strengthened in the faith as you were taught. And you'll overflow with thanksgiving. Something will come bubbling out of your mouth. Thanksgiving. Sometimes we have to get along with God and Clear the decks, clear the cobwebs, clear the mess. Consciously, intentionally, Lord, forgive me and replace what I am with what you are by the Holy Spirit living in me, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll be the last person to see it, by the way. Because 
we don't see Christ in ourselves. Don't, don't try looking into a spiritual mirror and saying, do I look Christ-like today? Oh, my, look at that. I'm, do I'm doing really well. Don't even try that because that will discourage you incredibly. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and the finisher. You know he was the author. Well, let him be the finisher as well. And it's other people meeting you who will see something of Christ. Let me finish with an illustration. You've heard the name Alan Radpath. It's been mentioned this week. Alan Radpath used to live here and be on the staff here. He's been in heaven now for a number of years. Very godly man, used in all kinds of ways all over the world. And uh, his books and his recordings uh, still being widely used. Alan Redpath suffered a stroke at the end of his life. He had a stroke some years before, a severely debilitating stroke. My wife and I went to visit him in hospital, and uh, he was a big man. He used to play rugby in his heyday. In fact, he was on the selection list to play rugby for England, but he played for Northumbria, a country to the northeast. If you don't know what rugby is, forget about that but it's big men, tough men who play rugby. It's like American football without any armor, just pure flesh and blood and bones. And Anyway, he was a rugby player because he was an older man now. He'd been tough. He'd been strong. We went into his room, and he was sitting in a wheelchair next to his bed, and his stroke had damaged his uh, taste buds, so he couldn't taste anything. And so he was eating very little, and he shriveled away. It was almost skin and bones. And as we sat down next to him, my wife and I, he said to us, I've never known spiritual warfare like I'm experiencing in this chair. Did I have battles I thought I had left behind years ago? I have things I thought had been dealt with and conquered in my life, and they're back. And he said to me, I did not know that my mind was so dirty. I felt a little bit embarrassed. I didn't quite know what to say, so I said something silly like, well, you've given the devil a hard time for most of your life, and now you're weak. He's putting the boot in and giving you a hard time, but... That didn't help him, of course. Then the time came for us to leave uh, the, the room. And before he left, he prayed. He said to me, I've got one engagement left in my diary now. I said, what is that? He said, it's the judgment seat of Christ. That's my next engagement. When he prayed, he prayed as a man who knew God because he did know God. And then we left him, and we'd agreed to leave at a certain time because we'd come at an awkward time, and the hospital staff needed to attend to him. And as we left the room, we're going down the corridor, and a nurse was coming to his room. And as we passed her, I said to her, you look after him, won't you? She said, oh, yes, we look after everybody here. I said, yes, I'm sure you do. But he's a very special man. And she stopped. We were passing, and she stopped. She turned around, and we stopped. And she said, uh, he is a special man, isn't he? I said, well, we think so. We've known him for many years. She said, well, so do we. He said, the staff, nurses, were talking the other day. And we were saying, we love working with Alan Rampa. She said, as we discussed this, one of the nurses said, whenever I spend time with Alan Rampa, I come away feeling clean. And this nurse said, when she said that, we all said, that's exactly it. There's something clean about Alan Redpath. A quarter of an hour before, he was saying, I have battles I thought I'd conquered years ago. I didn't know my mind was so dirty. That's what he would see. That's what you will see. That's what I see in ourselves. But they could see Christ. I did ask his wife for permission to tell that story because I didn't want to in any way embarrass or incriminate in any way at all because it's a beautiful story. And she said, yes, you may tell that story um, because this is a man filled with the Holy Spirit. He is the last person conscious of it in terms of what 
it's seen in him of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's see other folks who see it. That's why Jesus said, let your light shine before men. They will see your good works and do what? And praise your Father who is in heaven. Not they will see your good works and pat you on the back, see your good works and write a book about your good works, see your good works and take a picture of them, see your good works and make a video of them. No, he says, see your good works and they'll forget about you. Now praise your Father in heaven. And although we appreciate one another, of course, we appreciate the good things in one another, and I appreciate Alan Redpath immensely and did when he was alive, his influence in his ministry. But when a person is truly full of the Holy Spirit, you're more likely to go on to your knees and say, Lord Jesus, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what I see of you in that man. Thank you for what you're teaching me to that person. And that's why the end result of living and working and being filled with the Spirit is that the Lord Jesus himself becomes more evident. Jesus said about the Holy Spirit, he will glorify me. He will take what is mine and make it known to you. Not he will glorify himself, but he will glorify me. And the work of the Holy Spirit means we become much more conscious of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just in history, but in each other. Well, let's pray together. And uh, let's have a moment of silent prayer. In a place like this, we're exposed to the word of God every day, many times a day. And we have appetites to learn truth but God wants to go deeper than that. And he wants to live in the very center of our beings, to dominate our personality and determine our behavior by filling us with himself. In just a moment of silence, I'd like to ask you to talk to him about that in relation to yourself, and then I'll pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for every person in this building here this evening and every person joining us. Thank you for the work in our hearts we look back on. Thank you for the day you drew us to yourself. You made us aware of our sin, not to humiliate us, not to condemn us, but to liberate us and free us. And you gave us the gift of your Holy Spirit to live the life of Jesus in us. And Lord, I confess to you how easy it is to live in independence of him, to grieve the Spirit, to quench his work. And I pray that we'll be folks who will know what it is daily to come before you in humility, recognize our need and ask you to fill us and to work through us that our lives We'll speak of Christ through the distinct, unique personalities that we all have. We're not going to be the same. But we thank you for the way in which you will express yourself in us and through us. We want that to be the deepest desire of our hearts. And for those of us for whom that isn't, we're still struggling with this whole issue of your reign in our lives that we will come quickly that point of full surrender, that as we receive Christ, repentance and by faith, so we live in him on the basis of repentance and faith. Make this operative force, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're about three minutes over time, I think. Sorry about that. But uh, I don't know what you say to the folks who are joining us through live streaming, but uh, good night. <laughs> Unless you live in the middle of Australia, good morning.
Cape Henry Hall is a Bible school and a holiday center in the northwest of England. It's a fantastic place to take some time out with God, to dig deeper into his word, to have the adventure of a renewed encounter with the risen Lord Jesus. Bible teaching is central to everything we're doing at Cape and Ray. We believe that when we study God's living word, we encounter the living Lord Jesus. We have a variety of Bible teachers here on staff, and we also invite in a range of guest lecturers from a widespread of churches and ministries in the UK and beyond. There's also a program of practical outreach where we're sending students into local ministries to serve in evangelism and other practical forms of service. Living in community is a huge part of life here at Cape and Ray. We're one in Christ, we want to express that unity. And living that out in an international cross-cultural environment is a, a real joy and adventure. It was such a revelation to me that actually God speaks to us individually through his words still and that he is so alive and that he wants to teach us new things, that he wants to be involved actively in our lives. Coming through here and discovering uh, the truth about who, who God is and, and his life that comes inside of you um, and how that empowers you in your day-to-day -day life is something that just gave me a passion and a drive and, and a purpose that I didn't have before. I think one of the biggest things that I, I can take from this experience is uh, acknowledging and accepting that my identity is in, not in anyone else or anything other than my Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And to be able to live in that knowledge every day is something that I'll definitely take with me for the rest of my life. We're studying the Bible a lot together. We're involved in practical service a lot together. We have a lot of fun together. But what's most exciting is encountering together the indwelling life of the Lord Jesus Christ and really discovering who we are in him. Cape and Ray.